All right, Mitchell England, welcome to the REI Diamond Show. How are you today? Very, very good. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me here. Nice. So I'm in Chicago. Listeners know that. Whereabouts are you recording in from? <clears throat> so I'm White Salmon, Washington, about an hour east of Portland, Oregon, right on the, the Washington side there. So kind of a kind of a rural area, but but really beautiful. So okay, cool. So as our origination story, maybe you can kind of touch on uh how you got in real estate and sort of how you evolved into the space that you're in now, and then kind of a summary of where you're at now, just to get us started. Yeah. So, you know, I started really young. I, I stumbled upon Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I know a lot of people um, listening to this it, probably have a similar story, but I read that book and it like changed my whole perspective on, on, on life and how to, how to provide value. And it, it made me start to question everything. I, I probably read the book at 16 years old. Um, I was in, in high school at the time and, and I was watching the run up happen, right? That was like 2004, 2005, right in there. Um, I was watching a lot of people make a lot of money in real estate. And so that book paired with like this huge run up in the market. I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta like get in this game. I know, I know you're laughing, right? Cause what happens next? So, um, but that was my first, like, Hey, what is this thing? How do I get into the game? And, um, and I started asking that question. So early on, I, I jumped in, I bought a couple pieces of property thinking, Hey, I'm going to go make some money on these things. A couple bear piece of property, actually like vacant land. And, uh, you know, what happens next, right? Oh, eight hits and I, and I'm holding the bag, right. I'm holding these two properties going like, huh, maybe I don't really understand this game as, as close as I thought. And so throughout my twenties, I was really interested in real estate. Um, and I, and I, I dove into, you know, a couple other land deals, a couple smaller duplex, single family type stuff. And for me, the big aha was like, when I, when I got my first cash flow property, I thought, oh my gosh, like someone else can pay for this. This is pretty, this is pretty amazing. Um, I probably should have been a faster learner than that, but it took like six or seven years to figure out like, oh, I could put a renter in. That's, that's pretty, um, this is pretty incredible. And so, um, but that I got addicted to the cash flow real estate. I just got addicted to it. Cause I thought, well, gosh, this could give me not only like pay for my real estate, but also give me freedom. And so, so that was my, my, um, you know, that first cash flow property was sort of a, a house hack. And from there, I started to buy some other single family duplex, kind of some smaller stuff. Um, and then, um, you know, and during that time, I was, I was also working my corporate job, I was working at a med tech company. And so, so life was really busy, but I, but I, I started to see real estate as like this escape, this thing that I could do, I could build up cash flow, you know, properties, and slowly leave my job. And so, um, so that was really like the catalyst. Okay, cool. So then, uh, this is still in the same Washington Northwest United States market. Is that where this predominantly took place? You know, I I moved around. I I was I moved to San Diego for college, Florida for um, early on for for my first job, and then I moved um, ended up moving back uh, to the Northwest, then Minnesota. So I I bounced around a lot, and so I actually ended up buying some properties in different places, a couple of rental properties in like the Wisconsin Minnesota area uh, initially, and then also in the Washington area. And so right away, I, I, I dove into that, like, okay, not only is a cash flow property, but how do you manage something from afar? Right. And so that was, um, that was also interesting to realize like, Hey, with systems and with, um, with our technology and software and property managers, you can actually own things like out, outside your, 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 um, immediate area. So. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So by happenstance, you bounce around the country a few times, uh, it shows you there's a couple other markets. I think I kind of did something similar and people will probably laugh as I say what I'm going to say now. It's like I moved from Philadelphia to Chicago because my daughter was going into high school and I wanted to be local when I could finally do it. Right. I knew I'd kick myself right. if I didn't make that move. So I did it. Um, luckily, the Philadelphia office stayed in business and we did Chicago. Then we added a couple other markets. Um, and I would go into the in and out of these markets and some of them were still sustaining in, but just over the last year, two years, maybe, I feel like I'm finally, uh, grasping how to research at like a deeper level and pay attention to the numbers of things like population growth rate and what are the demographics. And for me, Mitchell, I've always been. I need like eight to 10 million people in a market or it's just not interesting to me. It's like Philadelphia, New Jersey, Tri-State, Chicago, Illinois, it, yeah. and like Atlanta was this tiny little 5 million person MSA. And oh, that's like super tiny. It turned out to be the best 
uh, market in the country for what we were doing here for the last like six or seven years. Very, very favorable market characteristics. Um, but man, it's like I've been in the business 16, 17 years, something like that. And just now, 15 years in is when I feel like I made the switch and started to pay attention. You know, I was completely ignorant of a lot of the opportunity around the country. And I was afraid to really look at that. And so maybe I'm sharing all this because we're going to touch on how you own um, assets throughout the country in a few minutes here. Uh, but maybe if someone's listening and they're still kind of that, you know, I'm investing in the backyard and down the street because that's where I saw the for sale sign kind of thing. It's like, I don't know, I've had properties out of state and in a lot of different places and certain areas of the country just outperform the others. And it's like in a five or a 10 year period, uh, the right selection could double, triple, I don't know, maybe even 10 X in some instances, uh, compared to some of the stuff that might be in your backyard already. So would you mind touching on the evolution to the mobile home parks and sort of, uh, what that looks like now? Yeah, of course. So I'll, I'll continue my story here. Like, you know, in my twenties, I'm looking at the, the single family duplex style properties. And I got hooked to that cash flow, like I talked about. And what I realized, and you you were kind of just touching on this was like, I can't find good cash flow in my back property, or excuse me, my backyard. And so um, like it, being in Washington state, a lot of the, a lot of the properties are pretty overpriced as well as like the state of Washington, Oregon are not necessarily landlord, you know, friendly. And so it made it a challenge. And I started to realize like, I need to get out of my market. And so, um, so owning a couple, you know, I had since moved back to Washington. I owned a couple properties in the Minnesota, Wisconsin area. And I realized like we can, we can invest all over the country if we set up the right systems. My partner, Travis Dillard um, comes from the technology side. So that's been really helpful too. And, um, and so when we, you know, when we got together, we, we put our heads together and we, we asked the question, like, how do we scale to multiple, you know, hundreds of units and how do we do that to where they're not all in our backyard? And so that took that we end up just deep diving on this topic. Like, how do we do this? Like, what would the systems look like? What would the software look like? And do we need to hire somebody like to be in-house for a, for an asset manager? And so um, right around this time, I had sold a single family and pulled out some cash. He sold a duplex and we came up with a crazy idea. Let's jump into mobile home parks because we like the fundamentals. We like the cash flow, and let's do it as far away from our house as possible <laughs> in, a, in a market that we like. Okay, I know it's, it's, it's sort of ridiculous. So we bought our first mobile home park in New Bern, North Carolina, okay, all the way on the on the, on the East Coast, um, you know, 2,000 miles away or something, 39 units, uh, almost half long-term RV, half long-term um, MHP mobile homes. And, uh, and we bought it and, we, and we, we underwrote it. We felt like it was a good deal. And, um, and then this morning I call him, I go, hey, how are you feeling? He goes, I think I'm going to throw up. And he goes, how about you? And I go, I... I feel the same way, right? We're we're both scared to death. We're going, what do we do, right? We're, we JV'd on this deal. It's 39 units, a little bit over a million dollars. And um, and what happened next was interesting. Like we started to we started to fail, you know, and we we in other words, we put a property manager in place. We felt like we could have a third party manager manage the property. They did a terrible job filling and keeping the the long-term RV. The property started to slide backwards. And we got like, we really got our like you know, school hard knocks, I guess you could say, like, we really got beat up on this thing for the first three or four months. And, but we were committed, right? We we're signed on the, we're signed on the debt now. Like it's, there's no going back. And so, so we started to build out systems. We started to, to, you know, build out a management structure checklists to where we could manage this thing from afar. And today we actually still own the property and, and it's a very well performer. Um, but it was, it was that first, like, we had to sort of rip the bandaid off. We'd both been in real estate for 10 years or so investing relatively close. I had a couple, you know, in another state, but like we didn't have something that was like that big and that serious, right? I had some smaller single families that, that weren't sort of as risky. And so, so that was our first jump. Um, but what was neat though, is once we figured it out, we realized like, you know, we basically said, look, if we can make this thing perform well, we can run it from our office in White Sand, Washington, 2000 miles away, then we can buy wherever we want in the country. And so like it became our goal over the, that six months, like to figure it out and to really solve the solve the problems. Nice. So let's pull apart the first deal. How did you find that deal and what made you put an offer in on that deal? Yeah, so uh, so it was on market we, through a broker. Um, we weren't we weren't terribly savvy at the time as far as like off market properties. Uh, we we my partner had a 1031 that he was doing. He was going to tick in tenant common and um, 
and I was coming in with some cash. You know, the deal was, uh, this was four or five years ago. And so the cash flow and the cap rate was pretty strong. Like we were up, you know, above near nine, nine cap, right. On, on actuals. And so we felt like with, uh, with, with decent, um, with a decent cap rate cash flow going in, as well as an area that's that's had a, a traditionally very strong population, as well as as well as job good job diversity, we felt like that over time we could force appreciate, we could move rents up into the right and uh, and and secure a win. We also got really good debt on it, and so we felt like hey, that the spread between the debt and the cap rate is really strong, and um, and it gave us a really good DSCR as well for our downside. And so so overall, we we you know we felt like look, this is a great like. Uh, jump into the larger properties like the mobile home park side. We have good cash flow and we have good coverage on the debt service cover, you know, coverage ratio. And those are two things we look at. By the way, we're really focused on like what's our cash on cash. That's our upside. What's our doubt? What's our downside? What's our margin above debt service, which would be your DSCR. So, so the rents were like one hundred ninety dollars a pad. Sound about right per month. <laughs> You're close. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think back. I mean, since we're, since then we're higher. So I think we are right above 200 or something right, right. And, there. and where are they at today? Four or five years later. Uh, so we're above like 300. We're right in there, but we're actually too low. We're, we're, okay. we're, we're, we're still chasing the market. The it's been a really good market for us. Um, the, uh, the market I would say is probably four to four fifty, and we're chasing those in a responsible way. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we want to make sure we're not um, raising rents too fast and we also liked, we love to add value, right? Like we added a dog park and a community garden and we like to make sure we go in and do repairs and we're, we're being responsible landlords. So it's always that balance, right? Like how do you keep up with rent, with, by, but also be, you know, doing a responsible way. Yeah, it's funny. I buy uh, multifamily stuff just to kind of keep in the tree like an IRA in a sense for me. It's not my main business sure. model. I'm not doing syndications. It's like I have some cash. I buy the apartment. And I'm, I'm not going to buy something with market rents. Um, but then I turn around and I look and I feel like I'm always chasing the market. And I'm like, wow, no matter how hard I try, I'm never going to like I pencil it to have more market. The cool thing is that, you know, when I underwrote the deal that I bought five or four or five years ago, whatever it was, um, you know, where I thought I would be at market 1200 a unit or something. Now I'm at like 13, 1350, 1250 and the market's 14 or 1450. But I'm right. still not at market. And I was like, oh, I guess this just kind of happens to all all of us owners over all the course of time. Like we're never going to get to like just perfect market. All of the units rented up because for the sure. market's always change. I mean, unless the rents come down, but we'll knock on wood for that, right? No, we'll knock on wood for that. Yeah, yeah. We don't want <laughs> we don't want that to happen, you know. But, you know, I think it's a factor of like, and we, you know, you can spend a whole podcast, you know, episode just on like inflation and money printing. But if they keep on... An, you know, putting capital in the system, rents have to go up, right? Uh, commodities go up, prices go up across the across the table. And so, so for me, it's like this last couple of years, we've seen a big influx of new capital and that's affected the, the, the entire game. Um, and so properties where we looked at two years ago saying, hey, market rent's 400, now it's 500, right? And so now now you get to 400, you go, shoot, I'm still hundred bucks behind. So, you know, I think, I think it's, um, it's up to every operator how they, how they manage this. But it's uh, but you got to look at that, and and you also have to look at the human side, right? How fast is too fast? What's responsible? Where 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 should you be adding value and making the tenants' lives better? They're your customers, and so it's not a it's not a cut and dry. Uh, hey, go in there and make them all market rents tomorrow, right? Yeah, hundred percent. So where do you fall, Mitchell, on the scale of? um there's syndicators who are buying and flipping whatever asset it is it's a mobile home park it's a storage facility it's a um it's a multifamily, and their goal is to flip it in three to five years on one end of the mm -hmm. scale so they're like fix and flip syndicators and then there's you know kind of the buy it and hold it forever kind of people at the other end of the scale whereabouts do you and uh travis fall on your ideal philosophy for hold hold times yeah, so the ideal philosophy for us is to hold forever. That, that the simple answer. We we've sold a couple of assets for different reasons. One was in a landlord hostile state, uh, and we were seeing the effects of that. We've also sold like we sold a C class apartment complex that you know um, the the problems kind of never end, right? So we we call it trimming the tree. Each each year we'll trim the tree a little bit and take the assets that um, you know we're all about lifestyle design. We want to live fun lives. And so when you have problem properties or properties that you see going the wrong direction, I think it's responsible to trim. But for us, our, our investment philosophy is like, how do we find an asset that we can buy, force appreciate, 
uh, refinance and put really nice debt on and, and hold for the long term to where you're, you know, ideally you're pulling your capital back out and you're able to go redeploy that, but what, but while still holding that asset. Um, I think that, I think that that's an interesting model because you can sort of grow generational wealth and, um, and it's also tax efficient, right. Versus sometimes, sometimes if you're selling these things, you're going to get hit by the, you know, the, the tax guy pretty hard. So that's kind of our philosophy. Obviously there's, there's probably no right answer with that. It just depends on your, your approach. Yeah. I was uh, following one of those guys on Twitter before the show. I checked in this morning and he had like, he had two charts side by side. This was his post and he was explaining that why he does the flip model. And it was like, well, I do the value add and I have this hockey stick. And then the cash flow stability period is kind of like more leveled off. It's like a plateau. Uh, so you and I are, are long-term hold kind of philosophy. I also share on the stuff um, that I own. Uh, so the the growth is much slower on that long term hold period. And his thing was like, if I'm flipping, he's got a hockey stick, uh, short cash flow, sell it, another hockey stick, assuming that goes well, and assuming he gets into the next deal and it's perfect. Right. Assuming, that, yeah, yeah, that hockey stick. And so he had like kind of three of them, and I'm like. I just don't know how that works out in reality, right? I follow Warren Buffett and he talks about the consequences of paying taxes all the way along the way. And, you know, um, some of the reason I bought the apartment buildings is to call segregation. I think the IRS tax code in the United States is great to incentivize me to put my savings to work in housing people yep. in affordable units compared to the stuff that's out there. I don't know that I would have been as interested in buying these apartment buildings had I not had a tax incentive to do so. So I'm like way ahead uh, by holding, owning and operating from a tax perspective. And then I'm I'm also under stress as I continue to earn income to find the next investment. And I feel like I'm trying to find that value add so I could he keep having to stair steps, but I feel like it's a little stressful <laughs> sometimes. I don't have the time to hunt for just the perfect deal that's out there. You get comfortable with an asset, it's cash flowing, you stabilize it. You're comfortable with uh, New Bern, North Carolina, and you know that you can get these things to 400 as the vacancies go, and you did the dog park, and people love it, and you got the feedback. And every time you buy an asset, you have to learn the asset. You have to churn the uh, population and sort of build the community there. So you do all that work um, just to send it off and have someone else kind of do the same learning process and probably churn it all over again and start over. I don't know. It seems like a, it seems like a, a lot of work sweeping back the ocean maybe and if that's the model and there's a very large scaled uh syndicators who do this perhaps it's just at a different location um than where you and i are right but two sides of the coin two sides of the coin yeah and i think that's where you know um there's there's so many ways to like look at this and like what asking the question what do you what do you really want you know out of out of real estate investing and that's that's something we had we've had to really identify our why and like where we're going with this and what's our vision and what's our what's our ultimate goal and our our ultimate goal on our side is like how do we create a portfolio that that builds over time that is inflation um, proof uh, ideally you know knock on wood not totally inflation proof but but um but it's a good hedge how how do we build a portfolio where other tenants are paying for my life via cash flow or also paying down my debt you know via via mortgage payments each each month and uh, and a portfolio where the where the cash that I put in and the cash that comes back to me is tax efficient. And so those are all the questions that I've asked. And, and it feels like the buy and hold model sort of fits in inside that. And so um, so that's where we are. Not to say people can't make money with the with the hockey stick model you talked about, but but again, like it's it's also easy to do a video and say, hey, here's what I'm gonna do. And like, and then you you go hit the you go hit the payment. It's like, well, I don't know if it's exactly like that, right? So yeah, right. Let's uh, see the HUDs and check back in like five years when we're when we may be on another great uh, decade for multifamily. But the cap rate compression we're looking at in the last decade, I don't know. It's like uh, it's a perfect timing, perfect storm kind of a market. Who knows? Um, you had mentioned more than once already on today's show, you alluded to good debt. Can you describe what the good debt was on your North Carolina property and what is good debt today in 2023, Mitchell? Oh man, good debt. You know, that's um that's a good question. So so our North Carolina property, uh, we were down like in the fours. We were probably four point five percent interest rate fixed for 10 years, 25 year am. Um, you know, that's that's good debt. I love that debt, right? When you when you have an interest rate that's at or below inflation, you're you're technically making money on your debt. And so um, so for me, that's really solid debt. Now today we don't see we don't have the same, we don't have the same options. 
Um, today, I think that if you were to describe good debt, I think you're looking at agency, Fannie, Freddie, debt, non-recourse, uh, your, your bigger, which which also changes the requirements or the type of properties you're, you're, you're going after. But a lot of people don't um, don't think about like the non-recourse side as well. Like at, on our way up, we've, we've been recourse. We've signed our name on a lot of, on a lot of debt. Right. Um, but as you grow, and I think as you expand and your, your net worth grows, you have more to lose. And so, so for me, the, the definition of good debt has changed over time. And today that's non-recourse. That's uh, that's ideally lower interest rate via like an agency or Fannie and Freddie loan, as well as like a longer, um, a longer term. So like a 30 year AM. So that's, I guess that's how I describe a good debt, but also debt lines up with your, with your cap rate, right? Like if you have no spread from your debt to your cap rate, your cash on cash, your property is going to be relatively low. And so, um, so debt changes over time too, right? Like if you're buying a 12 cap with 8% debt, well, guess what? That's, that's a decent cash flow property, right? But if you're buying a, a five cap with a 8% debt, then and you're not looking too good. So, uh, so it's, it's the whole picture we're looking at. What uh, will that uh, agency Fannie Freddie stuff? Does that work on mobile home parks? It does, uh, but they they have requirements, and so they want to see over fifty units. They want to see paved roads. They want to see um, tenant owned. So tenants own the, the homes versus the the park owns the homes. Um, they you know that they like the bigger parks. They want to see good collections. You're talking about properties that probably don't have the the, the value add um, component that probably, you know, more of a slow play, longer term hold. And so, so with that good debt also comes, um, you know, some kind, sometimes lower returns or potentials for returns. But again, it's what's your goal. If, you, if your goal is to buy and hold them forever, then, um, then it can work pretty well. So. So let's touch on the model. You guys have how many parks at the current moment? So we have six parks across the country. We have uh, inside our portfolio, six parks. We also have a boutique hotel. We have an RV park that's a, that's a short-term uh, park. Okay. And it sounds like parks is kind of the thing that you're hoping you'll find another three or four of or something like that in the future at least, right? It's the parks. Yeah, we like the parks. You know, we've uh, we've branched out to the short term RV, which is great. We 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 have a little boutique hotel, which is kind of in our backyard, which is a which is a side project. But but overall, like our our philosophy is um, is that parks are relatively undervalued um, uh, in the big picture. Now, if you go look at mobile home parks right now, like there's pretty high prices on them, relatively low cap rates. But you're also looking at rents that are a fraction of the next um, available apartment, and so. Um, part the the mobile home park space is really interesting. There's only about forty five thousand mobile home parks in the country today. They're also the inventory is also disappearing. So you're buying you're buying into an asset that has an inventory disappearing and the demand is growing. And so the fundamentals of a park, um, you know, there, there's just so many pieces to that. Like like if you buy the right park and it's tenant owned, you're really buying land. You're really a land lease model because you're not owning any structures. And so. With, a, with some of our best parks, we're seeing expense ratios as low as 20% because the tenants maintain, own and maintain their homes. They pay utilities and we're responsible for the roads and the culverts and the signage and the, you know, maybe the community space. And so, so for us, the park model is, um, is, has been really fun. Um, it also aligns with like our goal for lifestyle design because they're easy to manage, right? We don't have HVACs that are going out and roofs that need to be replaced in, in an all tenant park. And so the, there's just so many things that sort of add up on the mobile home park side. Now, the downside is a lot of people know about them and a lot of people are chasing them. And so going out and finding really good deals is not is not always the easiest. But as we grow um, in our business, you know, our goals have changed over time. Initially, it was like, how do we find something that's extremely value add, that's extremely run down, that's, that's very broken, fix it and profit from that model. And, and as we've grown, it's changed to how do we find something that's stabilized, that has a good debt cover, uh, you know, a decent cash on cash day one that we can hold for the long term. So our, our our philosophy on parks has changed over time. Okay, so we have two things I want to touch on here. I want to talk about the perfect park itself, and then we're going to talk about that uh, more stabilized kind of maybe on the recent deal. But first, let's touch on the perfect park. So you had mentioned the tenants own their houses. Are you buying these parks with paved roads? What are some of the physical characteristics of the park that makes it interesting to you? I, you know, if, if, if a broker called me and said, I, I have the perfect park, like for me today, it'd be, you know, uh, 50 to hundred units, uh, potentially, uh, potentially above hundred units. I'd love the, I love the big ones. 
Um, it would be city utilities, city water, city sewer. Utilities can be a challenge. If you own a well, you're taking on more liability for, for you know, testing for bacteria and ensuring you have, you have adequate pressure and all those kind of things. Um, you know, septic systems can be a, a big cost. And so having city sewer is a big plus. Uh, I think the perfect park would also have paved roads, would have um, some amenities as well. Um, potentially, like if they don't, we, we love to put in like a playground dog park garden, like we talked about before. Uh, and then also qualify, which, well, going back to the tenant owned, all tenant owned is really the, the, the bees and ease because the management is so much easier and you're not managing, you're not maintaining those homes. And so um, on the debt side, it would qualify for agency debt because, uh, because that's where you're going to get that best, that best interest rate, best terms, as well as, as, as uh, non-recourse. On the tenant owned units, are these usually older units? Uh, is there is there a strategy on tenant owned units where I don't know somebody stops paying and this thing's been there since 1977? You guys clear it and are bringing in a new unit and like sort of lining financing up. What what's kind of the turnover value add on those tenant owned units? Maybe is the question. Yeah, it's 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 not the easiest answer, honestly. That's one of the big challenges with mobile home parks today is. Um, you know, if I have a 19, say I have 1980s, 1990s homes in a park, right? And we, and we lose a home. It's hard to bring in a brand new home, get somebody to pay for a brand new home to locate it next to 1970s, 1980s, 90s homes. Yeah, in a right. Community that's maybe because you're moving in an A class or B class asset, a brand new, you know, mobile home into a C class neighborhood. So that is that's tough, and that's been tough for park owners. Uh, in that case, ideally you would remodel that home. And so you'd, you'd okay. go in and you'd, yeah. So you'd go in and you say, look, we're going to spend $20,000. We're going to seal the roof up. We're going to do, we're going to do the floors. We're going to do the, um, we're going to do the kitchen, which sounds crazy. But when you look at the lot rent from one home, it's, it's actually worth it. Right. So if you're able to bring somebody in, you sell it on an RTO, they buy it for 20 grand that you put into it. Right. And now RTO paying, being a uh, rent to own. Okay, cool. Yeah, as long as it's legal in the state, you can do a rent to own contract. So they buy it for 20, they put down five, four or five, right? And now you can rent that for say three or four hundred dollars per lot or per month on lot rent. Well, when you look at that, because that lot rent's all capitalized. So when you look at that across annually divided by your cap rate, you're way ahead by remodeling that home. So hmm. there's a little bit of um of logistics there, but like the 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 last thing you want to do is move the home out of the community because once that spot is vacant it's really tough to get new homes in there it's also tough to get used homes because the used home inventory is disappearing as well and wow. so it's kind of this you see what i mean so like we've one of our parks in north carolina we've located about five or six homes um that are used in there and that's been that's worked really well but that's because we have a really great local contact who's out sort of hunting for these homes and so unless you have that it's uh it can be really challenging now where you could pull this off is in a community that's like the homes say are like you know year 2000 or greater and it's a really clean community now you can attract people in for brand new homes to come in but it's the older communities where it's hard to mix the two yeah, and it's not like you're going to go to all your tenants and kind of like <laughs> get them to all to agree to let you to like swap out and do this million dollar capex to turn yeah. it into like. <laughs> oh, we've tried everything. We 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 tried to get them to paint their homes. We tried to get you know, and and it, but it's you know what it's 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 easy behind a desk to try these things, but then you go to the community, and you go, okay, got it, all right, this isn't going to work. So, you know, we've had to be creative over time. Okay, all right. So the perfect park now, you were talking about your evolution of mindset from going to this humongous value add, which I think when I started off and I had no money, that was like the only option. Like there had to be this egregious profit in 18 months or like it just wasn't feeling like it was worth my time. Um, I probably could get on board and I've bought some buildings that were, they're not quite market rate, but you know, the one I'm thinking of was seven units was fully stabilized and bringing like $10,500 a month, all section eight tenants. And that's the building that's gone without a hiccup in cash flow all the way through the stuff I bought that is value right. add has three, four vacancies and tons and tons of repairs. That one was somewhat more stable and it was nice over time. So are you finding... Let me ask you this question. Is there one of the last six that you bought that kind of fit that box you described? 
So uh, we're getting there. We've actually repositioned a couple of them that we bought very, um, we bought initially high value add that we are moving towards agency debt, which is going to be great within our, within our portfolio. But, uh, but no, there's nothing that we bought initially that we put non-recourse agency debt on. And so we're slowly migrating toward that. I think, I think that like the philosophy changes over time, because like you said, when you start out with nothing, you have nothing to lose. And so as you, as you gain and you build your net worth, your priorities change. And it goes from, you know, uh, high, high, high value add to capital preservation and growth. Right. And so, so I think that's, um, that's part of that, that internal change that's happened, um, you know, over the last year or so. So none of the six would really count as they were already stabilized uh, assets. This would be like the ideal next one, maybe. Yeah, this would be the perfect park, the ideal next one, and that's what we're okay. that's what we're on the hunt for, uh, the hunt for now. Yeah, and the reason I ask is kind of a lead, and it's sort of along the same lines of what we were talking about before. Uh, if the rents continue to go up, even if it's not five and ten percent <clears throat> or more, like we've seen in the last two or three years. Um, and we're playing this slow game and it is producing, I don't know, five, six, 7% cash on cash, which is not exciting. Everyone on the podcast, I don't know, 5%, I'll put my money in the bank, but <laughs> fast forward two, three, four years. And now the rents have gone up, but that's in, you know, above the mortgage payment. So you kind of have all these spreads working in your favor. And now all of a sudden, I don't know what it is, two or three years out. I have a friend, um, who buys nothing but the best retail corners, Main and Main Street, the best shopping centers, Walgreens, Buffalo Wild Wings, like all the best tenants who are paying his rent. And he's like, I never bought anything that was value add. He said, I always just want the best location, the best tenant, and that's it. And he's wow. like, in year one, it's like kind of the triple net model. He's like, year one, I'm probably making five or six percent. I don't care by year three, four or five, it's like 35%. And I didn't do the math and maybe he's talking about the perfect deal and things went his, <laughs> his favor, right? And he's like, I'm making 35% cash on cash return with his mortgage pay down and everything as he did the math. And I'm like, I never really figured it out, not even on my own portfolio. And I'm wondering if, you know, just that little incremental bump in rent each year from like inflation, two to 5% in rents, coupled with the mortgage pay down, I mean, does it add up to that much? Have you ever done the math on what that might do for you? Yeah, you know, roughly, you know, we, like we were just looking at a park uh, yesterday that's uh, 125 units and it's $8 million. And like, uh, and I need to di dive in even deeper here, but like, basically like what's interesting about that is like adding $25 to the rent, you know, say next year adds a million dollars to the park. Because it's all going to the bottom line. It doesn't cost me anything to add that rent. And so uh, maybe maybe we'll do a couple little value add projects, um, low cost value add. But like the the spread for me, that's why we hold long term. Because like people are looking to, you know, people are so short term minded that like your buddy, he goes, look, I'm five or 6%. That's usually not exciting to folks. But five or six years later, you bought, you know, $10 million in assets um, in that way. I think he's right. I think you could have spreads that are that are well into the teens or the or the early twenties, and uh, and you're just following this sort of like every year, you know, keeping up with the market, making sure your expenses are in line, making sure that you're that you're servicing your customer. And so I don't know about the thirty five percent. That seemed that seemed kind of high to me too. But but over time, you know, I think that um that you know our government brings in X, they spend X plus Y, and they print Y. I mean, it's that simple, right? So they keep adding. You know, I talked to this lady, I, I was cold calling and I talked to this lady in Seattle. She owned a park. This is like a 30 second story here, but like she bought this thing in like 1985 for like $300,000. And I said, ma'am, you know, my records show you have, you have debt on it for like $16 million. Is that right? And she goes, yeah, that's right. And I'm like, so I don't understand. So since, since you bought it, you put $16 million in debt on it. She goes, that's right. I'm like, well, so tell me what's going on. She goes, well, every year I raise rent. And every four or five years, I go back to the bank and I pull out tax-free money all the way up to 16 million. And I'm wow. like, that is interesting. And, and this is in Seattle. This is a high growth market. Obviously, we, we all know that. So it's not like we can repeat that every time, but like take a second and think about 20, 30 years into the future. What, what's the value of the dollar and how much have you pushed your, your assets and how much tax-free capital have you pulled out? Um, she really, I put down the phone and I was like, wow, this is, that's interesting. Yeah. And it's like, you got to get in the game. 
you got to buy the real estate. And I think at least from my perspective, I went out and bought like eight or 10, 12, something single family houses in Philadelphia. They're all these middle of the block, little row home streets. I'm never, I'm going to get lucky in a sense because there's a little gentrification going on in a neighborhoods sure. improvement, but I'm never going to get lucky in those smaller purchases with single family where uh, a corporate company absolutely has to own the location that my sure. three acres zone commercial is located on the main road. Right. Sure. So it's like you buy this property and this like lightning bolt strike of luck is part of what potentially could happen someday in the future. I would argue or posit that the lady in Seattle, the lightning bolt hit for her. She bought it way back in the day for what? 300 grand. Did you say? Yeah, I mean, it's like super low. It was like yeah. less than 500. Yeah. Right. And it was like probably not this great, wonderful asset then. And she got super lucky in that, you know, the demand for these units just continued to grow at, at like an extremely fast clip. And she's been able to, to kind of do that. I'm not advocating to go out and buy everything that's for sale, but you got to get in the game. and You got to buy these pieces. And I think it, I think it bears out our philosophy of like holding for the long term to kind of put yourself in that position to like wait around and potentially the lightning strikes and you're not selling it because you're pruning the tree. You're selling it because the offer is something you just can't refuse. <laughs> you can't refuse. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you could get that lightning strike, you, you, but, you know, like go work the fundamentals on a park, you know, or, or, or apartment building or, or a long, you know, a larger asset, just hold it for 25 years. If it's worth the same as you bought it for and it's paid off, they paid it, they paid it off. I mean, you could argue that's a lightning bolt as well. Right. I bought, I've got, I'm holding 20 million. It didn't even go up in value. I've, t I've collected tax-free money for 25 years and now it's all paid off and I have $10 million. And so real estate is one of those things. It's like, can you lose? Can you get burned? Absolutely. You got to be smart. You got to underwrite. You've got to look at your downside. You've got to look at your upside. You got to look at all the pieces and parts. But like, if you're able to hold, the holders win, in my opinion. Now, people can debate me on that all day and that's okay. But I think holders win. And, and yes, there's ways to make money and flipping and wholesaling a lot of other ways. But if you can shovel some cash into holding and hold on for for that for that long term and be patient, you know, like you talked about one of the richest men in the world, Warren Buffett, you know, he talks about holding stocks. He goes, when I buy a stock, I don't want to, you know, I better hold it for at least 10 years type thing. He's thinking long term. And so so I, I think that um, it's it's not human to hold because we like the fast payoffs. We like the fast you know, um, rushes of, of dopamine. Right. But but like <laughs> holding holding is valuable. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. Before we get to our wrap up section here, Mitchell, is there anything else around mobile home parks that we didn't cover? I just didn't have the foresight to ask about. I don't think so. I think we hit it. I I love them. I think they're I think they're interesting. Right now, you'll you know if you're out there looking at them, you'll you'll realize uh, the the prices are high. They're you know just like anything. Right now, we've kind of had a, a squeeze on um, interest rates rising uh, faster than cap rates have have risen, but. Uh, but overall, like, I think the asset's really strong. Nice. So you mentioned Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You got a couple books I see behind you there. Are there one or two you would recommend that maybe have something to do with what we talked about today or maybe just the business in general? Yeah. So like, you know, one of the books that Rich Dad, Poor Dad was actually, you know, one of the most influential books early on. Um, I also read uh, Multifamily Millions by Dave Lindahl. That one really, really changed the game for me, understanding forced appreciation, um, value add, like all of, you know, kind of the fundamentals of multifamily and, and uh, commercial properties above five, five units. And so that was really influential um, as well. All right, cool. If you could go back and share the crown jewel of wisdom with yourself as you were getting ready to pull the trigger on that first piece of land way, way back in the beginning, what would that be? You know what, for me, I would have, uh, I think I would have said, look, really, really, you know, dive in and start understanding the difference between speculation and investing. And uh, for me, it, it was all blurred. The lines were blurred. I thought that buying a piece of property at value, holding it and hoping the market would increase was, was investing. And for me, that was, you know, kind of a form of going to the, to the casino um, <laughs> versus, versus investing, you know, and that's what happened in 08. Look, I mean, the whole, the whole country was playing, playing the, the slots. Right. And so, but I think investing is different. Investing is looking at your upside, looking at your downside, understanding the, the, the your cash on cash and your in your debt service coverage ratio and and the the fundamental sort of key metrics. 
to where you can make an educated decision. And that's a different game, in my opinion, than, than playing the speculation game. So I, I would have told uh, my night, you know, 19 year old Mitchell to slow down, uh, dive into a couple more books and, uh, and get an investing game versus a speculation game. It's ironic. I kind of learned my speculation lesson, I think, you know, I don't know if it was three, four years ago or something, but I had, I had extra cash and I'm buying into the stock market following these nonsensical recommendations and buying in, buying in, buying in. Uh, I, I got completely out of that. And looking back, that was speculation versus investing. Um, and the thing, the thing that's funny, Mitchell, the action item is the same. I have to pull the trigger and buy that piece right. of land. I have to pull the trigger and wire off the money and buy the stocks. I have to pull the trigger and sign on the dotted line for the mortgage. And what I feel like internally is I hope I'm investing in my multifamily apartment deals for, you know, to use the example, I do the underwriting to the best of my ability. I thought I was doing that in the stock market, right? I thought I was doing some reading and I just didn't know maybe the metrics I should have paid attention to. Um, But when it comes time for me to wire the money on my next purchase, it feels like a speculation at that moment. It's like, here's the moment of risk. I'm firing off this wire. I hope the wiring instructions are right. right? (laughs) That's the first step. Yeah. Yeah. Like simple as that, right? It's a speculation on like, do they even have the right wiring instructions? Uh, let alone, okay, now I finally got the deed. Okay. They were actually the deed holder. It wasn't somebody that just pulled like some elaborate con game on me and this far out. So it's funny that investing and speculation sort of have the same action items, but like investing is this like higher level of intelligent acquisition of knowledge and wisdom of people who came before you and underwriting of the deal. And I guess we don't know until the end or five years out when our investment bears out or whether we did actually just speculate again. But certainly the first one, looking back, we all could feel like we were we were speculating. For sure. For sure. And I think it's, you know, the, the lines are always a little bit blurred. Like you, you wire off funds and boy, like, yeah, I feel the same way because there's because there's risk involved. The second you the second it leaves your bank account, you're signing up for for risk. And so, um, so I think balancing that risk, uh, you know, one of the things we, we subscribe to is really, really focusing on an asymmetric risk. Like how do I, how do I take on a little bit of risk for, for a potential big upside versus a lot of risk for potential, you know, big downside. And so, um, so that's, that's been a really, um, a key player in our, in our investment philosophy as well Is like, Hey, we're, we're wiring over a hundred thousand dollars. Are we wiring this over to make a hundred thousand dollars? Or are we wiring over for a potential upside of a million dollars? And like, that's a way different you know, one's asymmetric, one's symmetric. And so, so we, we pay attention to that as well, but, but anytime you, you, it goes out the, the bank account, you're risking it. What, what I think people don't realize, um, you know, the invisible tax is inflation. So it's sitting in your bank account, hundred thousand dollars. Well, that's also going down by X percent, depending on the year, you know, we've seen it pretty high in the last couple of years. And so by leaving it in your bank account, you're also accepting some sort of risk. So unfortunately, if you're in this system, you are accepting risk, no matter where your money sits, it's just how do you get into, into a vehicle that has less risk and greater upside? Man, we could go on all day. Um, Mitchell, what <laughs> what is the kindest thing anyone has ever done for you? You know, well, that's a really good question. I um I don't know, I don't know if there's any one pivotal moment, right? Or one one thing, but I look back on my life and like I get chills thinking about it. Like my mom is like uh my superhero. I mean, really, she is the kindest woman. Um been there for me every step of the way. I couldn't do this without her. I couldn't, I couldn't be who I am without her. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the woman I married Hannah today is the same thing. And so I, I'm surrounded by kindness, man. It's a huge part of my, it's a huge part of my life and what, what holds me up and builds me up. So not, not, not a single moment. I'd say I'm, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. It's, it's daily. Nice. Fantastic. So we didn't have time to really touch on it. Maybe you could touch on the zero to 100 tribe now and perhaps give uh, people a direction on where they might go to find out a little bit more about you and the community. 
Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you for asking. So, you know, alongside our portfolio, we, um, this, this sort of happened organically. It's like people are, are calling me, texting me, Hey, can we get coffee? Can we sit down? Can we talk more about real estate? And, and what I realized is like, I'm terrible about, you know, about getting back and text messages and phone calls. And so in the beginning, it just started out as this, like this, this, um, this way of community of communicating one to many. Right. And so we launched this community online and, and since then it's grown into an entirely different, uh, different sort of um, sort of setting and, and, uh, and community. And so zero to 100 tribe, what we've really built it out to be is like, how do we help people get from zero literally to hundred units and show them what we did, show them like the breakthroughs we had, show them the big aha moments, um, give them tools like pro forma analysis tools, teach them things like forced appreciation, how to, how to sort of, you know, take a property through a life cycle, refinance, pull cash out, we do a lot of deal analysis on mobile home parks and RV parks and hotels, all the stuff that we've done. And so this community is built around this idea, like, how do we take people that are really hungry and motivated and elevate them via knowledge first and encourage them to go take, you know, responsible action? So today we're about 750 members. Um, we're having a ton of fun growing that. And um, to learn more about that, go to, to go to uh, zero to 100, the number 100 tribe.com. And so you can kind of go, go join, um, go join for free and come, come say hi and hang out. Nice. And at zero to like T O and then the number one zero zero tribe.com, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Good stuff. Mitchell. Uh, I had a blast. I really appreciate you giving of your time and, and coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate it. Love your podcast and love what you're doing. So I appreciate it.